Hello and uh, welcome everyone to the webinar. We're just going to uh, give 60 seconds or so for various people to come falling in. I know there's usually a little bit of lag with people joining on these events. Uh, you will obviously be on mute and cameras off for the duration of the webinar today. But if you do have any questions you would like to have picked up by the webinar, then please make use of the Q&A feature within Teams and we will endeavour to pick up any of your questions as we go through. Obviously, if we don't have time and there are a lot of questions, we'll just get round to them after the webinar. But other than that, thank you very much for joining and uh, we'll just give everyone uh, a few moments before we get started. So I think we've got uh, a number of people coming in from a variety of time zones. I did see uh, registrations all the way across from India through the Middle East, through into Eastern and Western Europe and all the way across to the UK. Uh, so I guess it's uh, probably good morning from me and maybe Akash, it's good afternoon from you. To Robert, uh, to Graham and uh, everyone who has joined in. So. Thanks, Graham, for welcoming everyone. Uh, hi, good morning, everyone, and good afternoon from India and everyone who is joining from India as well as Middle East. Uh, it's a pleasure to have you all uh, join us for this session. I think uh, uh, Graham will start in a in a minute or so. I think everyone is just joining in. So, yeah, yeah absolutely. And obviously, this is uh, a session that's being recorded. So. I guess we'll be able to make this available to people who've registered and don't manage to join us live as well. Sure. In the meantime, let me just bring up the deck and put it on the screen so we are all set then. Fantastic. So um he's akash and i'm graham so i guess we should probably start with uh, a couple of quick introductions just so everyone knows what's going on uh akash would you like to start sure graham thank you so hi everyone good morning and good afternoon where you are joining from uh so i am akash audrey i lead the products uh specifically in the text technology domain for signet and uh, have been part of uh, some large implementations on text technology automation for some of the large enterprises across the globe. And this space is very interesting. So uh, every, every year we see some new regulations coming in, some challenges coming in for enterprises. And it's obviously great to see technology uh, enabling our enterprises to solve those challenges. So interesting journey so far and great to have uh, all of you today and we'll be looking forward to sharing my experiences with you. Thank you. Thanks, Akash. And I'm Graham Tilbury. I'm a partner at WTS Hansuki, and I head Hansuki Digital and lead on WTS Digital in the United Kingdom. I've been involved in the tax and technology, the, the tax transformation space for a little over 30 years. Uh, I also had uh, a few years where I was regularly attending the Business Europe VAT committee over in Brussels and trying to understand what on earth was going on with VIDA. So I try to make sure our clients are aware of what's coming down the track towards them. And at WTS, we work closely with a number of partners. And so I'm really proud to be able to join today's webinar and to help everybody get to know Signet One a little bit better. Cool. Thanks. Thanks, Graham. Uh, I think let's move forward. So. Uh, talking about VIDA, I think one of the key pillars of VIDA is e-invoicing, and I would like to kickstart uh, our webinar or presentation for today. So the, the main agenda, uh, as you rightly highlighted, uh, like VIDA has been the center of a lot of discussions in the Europe uh, and, and how it impacts businesses and how technology can actually help businesses in ensuring that they are VIDA compliant. So we'll just go through all of these key, key pointers. And as always, Graham, it will be great to have your insights on how how you know the enterprises should look at uh, enabling themselves 
through technology, through process changes. And so it's like people, process, and technology combination and uh, and come over it. Yeah, absolutely. So I think of, let's get to the basics first. So uh, with VIDA uh, comes the e-invoicing bit. It's the real-time reporting as uh, some of the you know, or geographies or authorities call it. So what is an e-invoicing? Well, very basic definition of e-invoicing is a digital exchange of invoices between the buyers and the sellers. Uh, the format is very important because what is not an e-invoice versus what in a, what is an e-invoice is all governed by the way the document is shared across. So it's all about the format and, and the mode of uh, the transformation of information. So I'll create a PDF, but if it's just a digital copy of the invoice, it will not be called an e-invoice. It becomes an e-invoice if I follow all the data fields and mandates which are being prescribed. So there is a fixed set of format which I need to follow generally an XML, which is then converted to a PDF, which is a human readable because you and I can't read the XML. So XML becomes the e-invoice and then it is interpreted into a readable format of PDF. And then it is communicated over, let's say email, it is communicated over people framework, uh, maybe like uh, Zuckford or Rachung. So there are different mediums and formats and transmissions of the way the invoice can be shared across to your buyers. And one thing I would just like to add at this point is invoicing here covers all of your invoices. And one of the things that frequently is a surprise to organizations is this means intercompany invoices as well. Um, and typically what we see is that the intercompany processes aren't quite as rigorous as they are for what a business might consider a, a genuine invoice. Uh, but within these regulations all invoices are equal so we have to make sure that the the data quality and the processes are right for intercompany as well and this also can have a, a very material impact on the volumes that you need to be aware of uh, yeah very rightly said graham so uh, irrespective of the type of invoices whether it is intercompany or customer so b2b b2g intercompany all these invoices fall under the regime and you have to ensure that the right process and formats are followed over there. Yep. Uh, now moving forward, what you have seen as challenges that come up with, with this e-invoicing regime is, well, firstly, there is no global standard. Well, people is a framework which is followed by a large number of countries, but even each country modifies the framework to suit their, their ecosystem. So like people is going to be used in, in Singapore, uh, even Malaysia in, in United Arab Emirates and few other countries, but all of these uh, tax authorities have modified the framework a little bit to ensure that it fill, fits their ecosystem and the way the transactions and uh, the, you know, the businesses function over there. So uh, for, for a large enterprise who has present across the globe, it is difficult to take care of all those, those standards across the globe. And, and new mandates come in every day. So whether it is a new country or a new authority introducing e-invoicing or whether an authority which is already doing e-invoicing for a while, changing or improving their ecosystem to make it more robust. Uh, so for an enterprise, it, it becomes like an ongoing process. It's not like a one-time project that you do and you are done with the whole implementation. You have to constantly improvise and upgrade your systems with the authority. You know, they, they are changing very fast. And of course, that brings in the future cost and the complexity and all of that. So all in all, it is always great to have a right partner uh, on, on these type of projects. So whether it is e-invoicing or tax compliance to have like the right combination of consulting and technology, work with your team to ensure that, okay, you are you know, compliant as well as at the same time, these changes don't impact your business as usual. Uh, so that's that's very critical over here. Completely agree. I think that there is so much change in this area and so many moving deadlines. Uh, it's imperative to have a, a trusted partner that can help you to work through this. And I think it's really important when you do move forwards and choose a particular software partner that you have the confidence that they'll be able to keep you up to date and they'll be able to manage no matter where in the world you suddenly find yourself with a new requirement. Uh, and obviously, just to emphasize that things change very regularly, uh, it was only a few weeks ago that the United Kingdom was still doing nothing around the invoicing 
Um, but with our new government here in the UK and our mm. first budget under the new government, we now have a formal consultation on e-invoicing, right. and it looks like there may be a, a little bit of a, a rush to catch up next year from a UK perspective, maybe a, a little bit more in with the EU rules, who knows? Very true, very true. I think uh, governments are looking at the advantages quite a lot. Yeah. And and with those challenges, I think let's talk about what are the different ways in which the authorities tend to implement the invoicing. Like some would go with a pre-clearance, so like Brazil or India or even Saudi Arabia, where you cannot have a, a kind of in or issue your invoice to your buyer unless it is cleared by the authority. Whereas some are a bit lenient, like let's say uh, Italy, where you have or or hungry where you have some time to actually report it to the authorities so it's like a post audit where the transaction has happened so the validation and clearance has done but you report it to the authority at a later date or or with a bit of time uh, overall so different different flavors bring in different set of challenges but i think all in all i believe uh, whether even if the authorities have gone ahead with a with a reporting model you no know, that's what we call the post audit and pre clearance is like a clearance model uh, most authorities will move from reporting to clearance maybe today or tomorrow because reporting is, is a first step where they want you to report and then as they they see that you are matured, the economy has matured, uh, they would want that okay clearance to happen so they have the real-time information of all the transactions that are happening across, across the nation. And again, I think this is just a, another reason why it's impossible to try and deal with this yourselves within a tax yeah. department. It's just another set of change that's going to happen. And so finding that right knowledgeable support for your business is absolutely essential because this will be impacting you every year, if not every month over the next three to five years as we see so many different timelines coming into play across Europe, across Asia, and just pretty much building out into all the territories that you're involved in. True. And I think that's what uh, uh, the next few slides are going to talk about, that what are the practical issues and why can't your standard ERP or your standard billing systems can help you do that. So. Uh, on a practical side of things, what we have seen is um, you don't have a single ERP where all the invoicing are happening. So as an enterprise, you would have an ERP, let's say SAP Oracle Dynamics, but you will also have a lot of billing solution, point of sale systems, which are spread across where the actual invoices are getting generated. And it, it is imperative to link that to the authority because that's where the origination of the invoices and that's where the transaction details are. And uh, and that's what becomes more important. So even the next slide talks about it, that why can't ERP do it all? And it's more about, you know, how legal systems will be able to do it. Uh, it will be like a two-way integration. And then, of course, the maintenance. So uh, it, it's a bit of all over the place in terms of how uh, your existing system can be upgraded or you can link everything together into your same system without impacting your business. I mean, I have a very particular view on this, that ERPs are there to be global enterprise resource systems. They're not designed to do things on a national basis. And we've right. seen this many times. You don't try and do tax, whether it's corporate taxes or indirect taxes, in your ERP system, because that's not their speciality. They're brilliant at doing things which are global and international. So you invariably have to go down the route of a specialist third party and putting in place the plugins or the add-ons to deal with taxes. And I think because of the inevitable overlap between VAT, indirect tax, sales tax, and an invoice, it makes much more sense to align the e-invoicing with that tax side and that national level rather than expecting the ERP to do it and not necessarily do it that well. Mm -hmm, absolutely. And I think that's what even uh, any enterprise that we are in discussion with, that's one of the key points of the discussion because generally the the IT team of, of a particular enterprise would think that ERP should be able to do it all because they have invested so much into it. 
Yeah. Uh, but you know, the functional team knows that okay, the output or or you know the ERP is not hundred percent there. You know they don't have everything for the compliance purposes. Okay, move, moving further, I think we have a quick poll um, on the on the deck. So let's talk about what is your planned approach for e invoicing. Maybe you can drop in your uh, you know, point pointers in the in the chat or in the questions. Because what ideally, uh, generally, we are planning for e invoicing will be either you will think of directly integrating. So we will we'll talk about the approaches of e invoicing and what I think uh, is one of the approaches you integrate directly with the tax authority, or you work with third party, or you go with an hybrid approach. I think those those are the three key decisions that you have to take. Uh, you, you can drop in your your uh, approach in in the comment box or in the in the Q and A box, and we'll just move forward, and I'll we'll come back to the to the responses in a while. Yeah, uh, and yeah, do please use that Q and A throughout if you do have any questions, and towards the end, I'll pick up those and we'll discuss them. Perfect. Now, talking more about e invoicing and its impact, well. Uh, I have one very interesting slide which showcases uh, why tax authorities are so much, you know, looking forward. Like you talked about UK, or whether you talk about Germany, or some of these countries, like they they so much want to implement e invoicing as soon as possible. And the reason is this growth that you see here. So this is an example of India, where you see if uh, I'll just bring up my pointer. Give me a second. Yeah. So if you'll see here, this, this growth here of 30% that you see is when the e-invoicing was implemented. So without any change into the tax percentage and the tax slabs, the authorities are able to increase their revenue by a large margin just by implementing real-time reporting or e-invoicing. And the other important growth or, or a major growth that you see here of 20% is when they started linking uh, the e-invoicing and the input credit, the input tax credit, along with your vendors invoices so all the whole reconciliation was done and if you combine both of them it's like a 50 percent growth in the revenue of a tax authority and that's enough motivation for anyone any any tax authority to start and implement the uh, e invoicing as a while and we would see exactly the same pattern in the eu as we would in india if you look at the different changes in vat regulations that have been produced in the eu each one has been to drive down the VAT gap as they liked. Mm. They basically already put all of those easy wins in place and moving on to this proper e-invoicing process is the last remaining lever for the European Union to put in to try and increase declarations of VAT and to try and control some of the fraud that they perceive. So this is exactly the reason that governments around the world are doing it. It's how they make sure that that VAT gap is minimised and they've got the money coming in to fund all the services that we all want them to be pushing out to our populations. Exactly, exactly. And and with the with the current regime, I think increasing tax rate is not an option for any of them. So these are the resorts that they go to. Yeah. And uh, if I see the same thing going across the globe, like countries across the globe are moving towards this, or whether I talk about Europe, or whether I talk about even even Africa, like Zambia, Kenya, Egypt, they all have have you know resorted to e invoicing to increase uh, the overall reporting towards them. And that brings me to what are other different phases in which these authorities tend to implement it. So generally, uh, what you see is. Uh, the phase one is where all the countries are there right now. So a reporting of summary of your VAT return, either digitally or either manually, different authorities have different ways. And then from there, they are moving towards this e-invoicing, where I think one way is to have an SFT reporting. So along with the returns, you upload all your transactions. So it becomes like a like a SFT reporting. You have the transactions, but at the end of the month, then they move towards e invoicing and then linking of the e invoicing to returns to input credits, and then eventually moving towards B two C invoicing as well because that will be the only piece remaining, and they would want to even capture that information and and don't leave that out.
Now, a quick status check on, on v Vida because uh, this whole uh, initiation or the framework which which is coming on up in, in EU, it is under the framework of Vida. And um, very, very finally, we have got the new declaration. It is going to happen in 2037 as a mandate. Like that's, that's a good a long roadmap that uh, the EU union has adapted to. Uh, but uh, I don't think the tax authorities are, are going to wait till them. It is more of like a runway that has been provided. And yeah. in the next two to three years or maximum four years, we'll see most of the authorities, major authorities moving towards uh, these these initiatives. Yeah, absolutely agreed. I think now we've had the certainty around the dates and we're going to have that digital reporting actually now finally penned in for 2030 um, and with the other pillars of VEDA in 2028. I think what this is going to do is mean that all of the internal domestic e-filings will start to happen and build up in a, a runway as Akash described it because the dates for VEDA are just about the cross-border intra-community alignments all of the countries like Germany and France that have already been announcing domestic e-invoicing, they've just been pushing those back just a little bit each quarter because they didn't want to realistically go live with those whilst the main VEDA package hadn't been signed off by the European Union. Now it's signed, they're not going to push back anymore and we're going to see a whole flurry of these coming through across Europe. Um, and surprisingly, even potentially in the UK as well, because the the weird position we have with Northern Ireland under Brexit means that we actually are already committed to VEDA in the UK for Northern Ireland. Um, and as soon as the Republic of Ireland goes live with its own e-invoicing, that's going to force the UK's hand on Northern Ireland as well. So things could happen even quicker than you'd expect from the uh, the usual timelines that we see. Yep, yep. I think I think that's what the agenda is to not like wait till the end, but you know work on all the activities which are needed in that uh, particular time frame. And 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 the three pillars which which are being described under Vida are I think you rightly mentioned about digital reporting. So that's one of the main pillars of having everything reported across to the authorities through invoicing, through real-time reporting and uh, all the intra-country and you know, intrastate transactions which are happening within the EU. So that really helps get get the, the visibility across the union mm. as as well as to ensure that the overall economy, whether it is for the uh, for the short-term rental accommodation and all, all the transportation which is happening in between is also rightly reported across across to the union. And the third one is going to be a major one where where it is talking about a single VAT registration. I think that will be huge to have the EUSS and OSS, which is like I would say they have the framework or or like a like a homework done where yes. we you know any enterprise have to report those uh, you know OSS transactions. But with the single VAT registration, it will just take it to the next level where you have like a like EU wide visibility of a transaction of an enterprise. And moving towards uh, more about the challenges which would come in uh, for, let's say, the authorities as well as for the corporates in this whole implementation of VIDA, e invoicing, and real time reporting, and all of them is about, I think, having the ecosystem ready to manage all these volumes as well as to have the transaction level reporting, because I don't think right now they have the mechanisms to do it. So it will. It will lead a lot of investment at at both ends to ensure that those reportings happen, and with that, they will also have to invest in uh, creating the right engines for the reconciliation. Because then you have got data of e invoicing, you have got the data of your VAT returns, direct tax, corporate tax, a lot of lot of transactional data, and then mm. reconciling and then issuing the audits and notices all of that. Yeah, I think there's several things to say here around the challenges of getting ready. Um, the first is you cannot underestimate data quality. Mm. You cannot just drop an e-invoicing system on top because you will rapidly find that there are quality issues in your underlying data. And so the sooner you can start addressing data quality issues, the better. Um, I think the fact that we're going to see 
a number of individual countries doing domestic e-invoicing is fantastic because it gives organizations a chance to work through all of the difficulties of getting the data right just in one territory, understanding what you need to do with internal IT. And it's almost like a, a pilot or a case study to make sure you know how to adopt this. I think the second thing to say is that you will face people trying to kick this down the road and go, we don't want to invest now if we don't have to. We want to wait until the last possible minute to commit to our spending. And I think there's two mm. very good ways to address that. The first of which is this will be a lot more costly if you wait, because if everybody waits until the last moment, the capacity in the system to roll this out is going to be a lot less and you'll end up having to pay premium fees and you'll end up having to pay hand over fist to a, a large consultancy organization to try and rush through this, which isn't necessary, not least because most organizations will find that in the medium run, this is cost saving. Every person that's ever looked at this, all of the reports that come out will show you that the cost for processing an e-invoice is a lot lower than the cost for processing a paper invoice. And that is even more obvious when you come to look at sending invoices out rather than receiving them. So you can usually make the case on a fairly short timeline to go ahead and implement e-invoicing just in terms of existing cost base without having to look ahead to mandation and to the increased costs. So I think, yes, there are challenges, but we also need to understand there are a lot of benefits. And if you can move early, you can really lock those in. Very rightly said. I think the cost saving element is, or maybe the advantage or looking uh, at e investing positively is very, very important, Graham, over there. And um, I think, uh, the the authority in India and in Saudi, when when they said that they need to do the B two C E invoicing, there was a lot of uh, you know I would say backlash or there was a lot of concern from the enterprises, especially the large retailers and the marketplaces, on how complication would arise. But with the advantage of saving of of the amount for sending in a paper invoice, then sending an email or a, or or an SMS with a link. They, yep. they could see the value over there and that has actually resulted in a good good rollout yep exactly Absolutely. now the, so to, to handle these challenges let us look at how technology can help and what what generally the approach that various uh, enterprises have taken on on these different geographies so while talking about the overall e invoicing i always go and talk about on impeeling approach so this is more about well, don't look at e-invoicing as okay one step or a one project. Look at it as how it can impact and improve your overall process. So your AR, so your receiving and and your and your sending. So all those processes will be improved by this. So how you are processing your incoming invoices, you should even look at that. So it's more about doing it like a like a right way, ensuring you have fixed all the root causes, fixed all the gaps as you do the implementation. And here, these are the three key approaches. So I, I guess I've been talking about this, but just to put it out in, in a simpler way, whenever any tax authority comes up with an e-invoicing, they give you generally these three approaches. So one is they have an open API, and from your ERP, you can directly push the invoices to your, their, their ecosystem. This is a very complicated process, and your ERP, which is your core business application, gets impacted by this. And second is uh, it's more about using a solution provider like Signet or et cetera to have them, uh, you know, have as a middle middle layer in doing the end-to-end -end integration. And third is having a people framework. So maybe through through an through a framework, through an ecosystem, you are able to send and receive the invoices. And generally what we have seen is uh, the solution for these approaches is first, if it's a non-people, then you have a very straightforward approach where from your ERP, you can have a middle layer or a middleware, which is actually helping you transform the data. Now, this is a very important element. And I think, Graham, you also highlighted that quality of data is very imperative. Yeah. And 
And we have, we have seen that uh, there are issues with the VAT registration numbers of your vendors or your customers. So even your master data cleanup becomes very important. Yes. And and that's where middle middlewares help you because they actually do your uh, ensure that your master is cleaned up. They validate the data, and in case there are requirement to to have some of the fields which are not even recorded in your ERP as the first step, but are mandated by the tax authorities, but can be processed through some business logic. Those fields can also be generated or or converted here as a, as a middle layer, and then these can be reported across to the tax authorities. Uh, because what we have seen is in your SAP, there will be a tax code. But what if authorities, uh, tax authorities are looking for uh, a tax rate, a tax code, and different flags like whether it is a reverse charge transaction or whether it is a tourist scheme transaction or a VAT reclaim transaction, etc. But in SAP, you're just recording one tax code, which actually encompasses all of them. So you need a decoding layer in between uh, to decode that tax code into these multiple columns. I actually think that this kind of a slide is one of the most dangerous things that will happen to tax and invoicing people because you look at a slide like this and immediately your internal ERP support and your internal IT support, they start seeing words they recognize. They understand what ERP is. They have a vague idea of what PEPL is and they understand XML. And they immediately start going, oh, we know how to do this. We should be running the project and we're going to build this ourselves so it's properly integrated with the ERP. And what they never understand is that there's so much complexity from a tax authority perspective, from a government perspective, that you need to have that additional knowledge. And as soon as you hit that, you're into maintenance issues. And the scope and the scale of doing this is going to actually be a lot cheaper if you go out and use a partner like Signet, like a tax software vendor, who will be able to manage and keep all of those updates in place far more cost effectively than could ever be the case for one single organization, no matter how large. You know, they wouldn't go out and decide they're going to suddenly build a new payroll system they will buy a payroll system. They will integrate a payroll system. They won't try to build one from scratch themselves. And they clearly shouldn't do that for e-invoicing and for indirect taxes either. And it's something that the community from an taxes and from an invoicing perspective needs to try and guide internal IT about. Otherwise, you will end up in a position where a lot of time and money gets expended on an internal approach, which ultimately will end up having to be replaced with a, a properly built solution in the future. So we just need to save that cost and that trauma and guide IT away from leading on this. True, true. I think very rightly, right example of even payroll or any other such systems where you know you should go and buy it from the experts other than you know trying to build it yourself and uh, and that that will give you a, a burden to maintain it because governments and tax authorities are going to change and evolve their systems and then you are you have no choice but to keep it updated on a regular basis. Yeah. And similarly with the, with the people, well, on the people framework, the advantage that uh, that gets into the ecosystem is the service provider network. And people being a global, global platform as a whole, you get an option of a lot of service providers. And at the same time, even the fields and the data fields are so much more flexible in terms of accommodating the data that needs to be flowed across. And in, in a five corner model or a four corner model that we have seen, well, the, the flow has been very simple where from a supplier, the data or the invoice moving to the corner two. So the validation here, the corner two becomes very critical because the data validation and ensuring that the authenticity of the e invoicing is, is there is now a, 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 you know, a responsibility of corner two. They are then using the global dictionary to ensure, okay, to whom do I need to send this invoice 
as a buyer, which service provider are they using? And then the invoice is directly integrated to the ERP. So it's a very uh, streamlined uh, way of sharing your invoice and it really automates the whole uh, accounts payable. So if I'll talk about the source to pay platforms that we see and talk about, while well, it takes away like half of the complexity of the overall source to pay cycle for, for a large enterprise. And also what we have seen is more and more tax authorities are modifying the four corner and adding themselves as one of the corners. So with that, what comes is, is corner two is then also responsible of sharing those invoices and transactions across to corner five as a reporting. And then uh, the, the reporting of the corner five comes into picture where authorities are implementing data warehouse and BI to do all the reconciliation and then trying to find out what's happening in the economy and, and any discrepancies if there are. And, and one of the important aspects which most of the enterprises miss is looking at e-invoicing and VAT compliance in silo. Uh, if I'll say, well, if I'll validate the e-invoice just from the perspective of whether it has all the fields or not, and not look at it from a VAT compliance, when I'm doing my VAT reporting, it will become a challenge for me because if that e-invoice has some issue from the VAT standpoint or, or a taxability standpoint, it means I need to then issue a credit note issue a new invoice into the whole e-invoicing framework and that becomes more complicated and hence we we try and, and iterate that your e-invoices should also be validated from a VAT perspective we call it verification of e-invoice uh, but this is an overall like an integrated framework where right from your ERPs boss and billing solutions all your invoices are actually collected, validated, not just for e-invoicing, but also for your VAT return preparation. So both of those aspects are taken care. And then the e-invoicing is also done as well as the reconciliation and VAT preparation are handled. So it's like a one-stop solution for, for your core compliance needs as a whole. And I think there's so many reasons that you have to consider this and you have to work with a provider that does this as an integrated service. You, you're going to see benefits from a cost perspective and from a process perspective, as well as a robustness perspective, because if you've got to try and coordinate two different vendors, or maybe something that looks like one vendor, but actually is two vendors behind the scene because of a recent acquisition, there's still going to be a lot of internal integration issues. There's going to be a lot of, shall we say, finger pointing that it's not the invoicing part of the business's fault. It's a problem with the tax side of the business and vice versa. Whereas if you can take a properly integrated platform from a single provider, you're going to save all of those coordination issues and you'll find that the time taken to deploy and to get past any of the implementation customization elements will be a lot smoother, a lot quicker and you'll find you're able to respond to all of the tax control framework, accounting officer, and audit issues much more easily. So I'm very much a believer that you want a partner that does both fully integrated together within that one software vendor. Absolutely. And uh, I just have to emphasize on how this can benefit the whole VAT compliance. So if you do e invoicing and VAT all together, what it mm -hmm. really helps you do is you've got your e invoices generated by you as your output. So that becomes your, your liability. All your e invoices which are generated against you becomes your input credit. So all in all, it really gives you your VAT, uh, you know, VAT liability as a whole as well as you can have your e-invoice and VAT reconciliation done within the system. So the possibility of receiving an audit notice from the tax authority because there are any discrepancies just goes away and you, you are more ready for any robustness or any issues from that perspective. Uh, I think we have just got about five minutes left. Uh, I'll quickly move forward uh, on the technology benefit. I won't take much time, but uh, this is to highlight uh, that technology will not just help you in ensuring that you know the data is digitally linked from end to end, right from your source system of your ERP and billing solutions to the tax authority and to your buyer. Uh, but at the same time, it will be uh, secure and it will also be able to handle large volumes uh, which your business will generate. 
and at the same time verification of e invoices uh, i cannot emphasize this more but uh, the, the, the imp it's very imperative to ensure that your e invoices are uh, vat compliant and are ready for any vat reporting as a whole this is just a zoomed in view of how the corner one and corner four look so corner one is when you are actually acting as a supplier in the people ecosystem so you are generating e invoice and then there are multiple options so E invoices copy is definitely going to the authority, but if say your customer is also a B2B, then you have to actually, it automatically gets reported through API in their ERP. But if it's a B2C customer, then also you can use your E invoicing facility and have like a portal or a link through which they can actually access their invoice rather than printing and, and you know, just it will help you in overall cost saving from an E invoicing perspective. And same goes on the receiving side. So at the corner for when you're receiving the invoice, you have the whole automated posting. You can do your reconciliation and even go ahead with the, with the payment automation as a whole. So Akash, as you said, we're getting very close towards the end of our time. What should the people on this call be doing to plan for e-invoicing? I think rightly said, let me just quickly move to the uh, to the key part, like, Step one is very simple and we can't emphasize this more that start early. Don't wait that, okay, I have about a year and a half or two years to actually be prepared, but uh, the impact that it is going to bring, you should start thinking about it today. You should look at you know the gaps into the system. If you have a very legacy application or an ERP, it is going to take you at least six to eight months just to upgrade it to the latest cloud model or the cloud version that particular ERP has. So always start early and understand the processes that you are doing manually right now or whether you know how you are generating the, your invoices what are the touch points and whether all those touch points are or can be digitally linked if not focus on that and start moving it towards like more digitization internally because you will be able to send it to authorities later like digitization externally can happen later but internal uh, digitization needs to be done now and again, this fourth step is very important, the master cleanup. So your vendors, your names, addresses, your customer details, they all will get validated once e invoicing starts. So if you're not doing it today, tomorrow you will be end up having a lot of backlog of your e invoices getting rejected by authorities because one of those details is incorrect and doesn't match with the, with the system of the authorities. And of course, you should always be doing this anyway. It's just as Akash says, once it's become automated through e-invoicing, it won't be able to go through incorrectly, but it's something which is already a requirement and actually maybe an easy internal sell to just do one of those master data cleanups, which maybe periodically is acceptable already and kind of tucked away within the finance budget somewhere. So that's always a good step and can then help you to branch out in some of these other areas. True, true. And, and I think apart from the master data cleanup, again, focusing on how your VAT compliances are handled. So like tax determination to how the return are getting processed, how much manual uh, intervention you have in your tax compliance uh, processes, that becomes like your final step to ensure that, okay, you also try and digitize and have a digital link into the whole process. So I think that brings up to the a quick recap of, of our uh, discussion. Absolutely. And you know, without wishing to steal Akash's thunder, um, the invoicing isn't coming, it's here. I mean, that is absolutely the core thing that we all need to focus on because it is in a number of territories already. I know a lot of organisations don't necessarily even realise this. And then when they reach out to colleagues in South America, for instance, they find that there's a whole army of people manually rekeying those e invoices because they've not gone for the four corner model. They've just got the couple of corners working within the e invoicing system, and then they're manually rekeying back and forth to the ERP system. So, whatever position you think your organization is in, there's probably cost saving to be locked in because e invoicing is already here. Right. I think so. 
the the steps or the recap is very clear you know you should look at standardizing those things and looking at whether do it doing it yourself so there will be some bits that you can do it yourself like maybe the initial part of internal digitization but as soon as your data starts flowing external you should always look at partners and look at consultants and tech consultants and solution providers to ensure that the data validation and all of that is taken care of other than you trying to maintain the whole thing internally and of course, the country coverage is very important of where all you are operating, what all uh, things that are being to be taken care of. Now, I know we didn't get uh, a lot of questions in during the session, but I'm sure that after today, we'll be dropping out copies of slides to people and providing contact information. And you're obviously welcome to get in touch with Akash or myself or our organizations if you do want to ask any questions or follow up after today. But other than that, uh, we are at the hour and we've come to the end of our time. Thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you from myself and from the WTS network and Akash. Thank you. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining. And uh, rightly said, do drop in for any questions, whether it be related to e-invoicing, VAT compliance, or overall finance digitization. So any pain areas that you have in your existing process, and we'll work our best to ensure that we have the best solution for you. And that's it. Thank you, Graham, for, for all your support over here. Thank you so much. Pleasure. And hope everyone has a great day. Thank you. See you, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.